Hello everyone, so you know how a lot of people in our little corner of YouTube make videos about things that they actually know about, like philosophy or politics? Well, I try to make videos about those sort of things, but I'm actually not that informed on those sort of subjects. I'm especially uneducated when it comes to things like economics or when it gets really, really complicated. And considering I'm supposed to be making videos about that, it can sometimes get a little bit... Saddening. So then I thought, what can I make videos on that I do actually know quite a lot about? Now if you don't know, I do a media production course. And though I specialised in my second year in photography and single camera, which is essentially filmmaking, in the first year we had to do pretty much everything. We had to do TV, we had to do radio, and we had to do design. I love learning about design, and even though I decided not to follow that as a career, I still like learning a lot about it. As such, even though my course is mainly practical, I chose design-based classes in the theoretical side of my course. And I've written essays about design. And I feel like this was all concentrated into one specific topic. I know an awful lot about the Bauhaus. No, not Bauhaus, the shitty 80s goth rock band, the Bauhaus. And as such, I thought it'd be interesting to make a video on the Bauhaus. Now you're probably asking yourself, why, Jacob? I want to hear you talk about the stultifying effects of religion and why George Bush deserves to be executed. Well, the thing is, I actually think that the Bauhaus is incredibly interesting. But what I think is a good reason for you guys to learn a little bit about it is the fact that most of us look at and experience things that were heavily influenced by the Bauhaus every single day, and the vast majority of people know very little about it. So take off your shirt, get on your knees, and get ready to suck my knowledge cock. A vulgar metaphor, I grant you, but I feel it is appropriate. So, ready to learn? Let's go. First of all, what is the Bauhaus? The Bauhaus was a German art and design school that existed from 1919 until 1933 when it was closed down by the Nazis. Great. Is that it? No, that's not it, you fucking moron. There's so much more to the Bauhaus than that. So let's just start with the basics. How did it all begin? The Bauhaus was founded by a guy called Walter Gropius, who in 1919 broke away from the state-owned academies and wanted to start his own school. He wanted to start a school that would reconcile the traditional divisions between art and design and industry and to prepare the art and design world for the era of mass production and the machine. So Walter Gropius got a crap load of people together in Weimar and started the Bauhaus. Now initially the Bauhaus was actually very expressionistic. Expressionism, if you don't know, was an art movement that was based around creating a subjective view of reality that was focused on feelings and emotions. Expressing the feeling of being alive rather than just representing the world as it is. Now even though you can get expressionist art, expressionism runs through the entire range of media. So much so that you can even get expressionist architecture. I know, crazy right? Now because of the way that the expressionist era of the Bauhaus changed later on, I often associate the early expressionist style of the Bauhaus with a man called Johannes Itten. Johannes Itten was an artist and colour theorist who taught the preliminary course, or the Vorkers, at the early Bauhaus. Johannes Itten was fucking weird. He was a follower of the Mazdaznan religious movement, which had weird beliefs. He shaved his head, he wore red burgundy robes, I don't think he ate meat, he encouraged fasting, the use of laxatives to his students, and some sources even say, although I'm not entirely sure about this, so do not quote me here, that Johann Zissen even encouraged colonic irrigation. Alright students, let's carry on from our last lesson about colour theory, but first, let's flush all the shit out your colon. But even though it sounds crazy, a lot of his students lap this up. Oh, bad choice of words when talking about colonic irrigation. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of his students actually went along with it, a lot of them became Mazda's nans themselves. And apparently there was some degree of tension between the students who followed Johann Zitten and were Mazda's nans and those who weren't. And of course during this era the art and design of the Bauhaus was very expressionistic, as you can see here. And towards the end of this expressionist era the Bauhaus was having some let's say, political problems. They weren't in very good standing with the local government for whatever reason, and so they decided to move from Weimar to Dessau. And I personally associate that geographical transition with the transition in the Bauhaus from the expressionist style to more modernist styles. This came when Johann Zitten came back from a trip to a place called Herleberg, I believe, and apparently he didn't quite feel at home at the Bauhaus anymore. Apparently Walter Gropius and others wanted to move towards a more modernistic style anyway, so Johann Zitten resigned. And he was replaced by one of my all-time favourite designers, a Hungarian Jew by the name of Laszlo Moholy Nagy. Laszlo Moholy Nagy was vastly influenced by constructivism and was fiercely modernistic, completely different to Johannes Itten. And I always associate him joining the Bauhaus with the move from expressionism to modernism. And this is where the general perception of the Bauhaus as being fiercely modernistic began, around 1923 to 1925. Now I've been talking a lot about modernism at this point, but what actually is modernism. Modernism as a design style has various 
aspects to it. They favour uncluttered clean designs, pure simple geometric forms, uncluttered by what they saw as needless ornamentation, and a preference for putting emphasis on notions of space rather than mass. Essentially, this modernist period of the Bauhaus was influenced by a lot of different modernist movements. The two that always stick out are Russian constructivism and Dutch de style. Let's start with Russian constructivism. Russian constructivism was an art and design movement that began in Russia, hence the name, that fiercely fought against the idea of art for art's sake, making art because it looks nice. They believed art had a social duty, and that's why they made it. Russian constructivism was often very geometrical, with sharp, clean, straight lines, and like I said, influenced Laszlo Mahal quite a lot. Now I find Dutch de style much more interesting. Dutch de style is all about forcing extreme simplicity in design. They eschewed the use of curved diagonal lines, they emphasised the use of primary colours, red, blue and yellow, and the primary values of black, grey and white. They wanted to make everything as simple as possible, and if you have an arty inclination you recognise that a lot of their designs were heavily influenced by the work of Piet Mondrian and Cubism in general. The movement was started by a guy called Theo van Duisburg, although some other contributors include people like JJP Oud, Bart van der Leck, and Garrett Rietveld. Garrett Rietveld designed this very uncomfortable looking chair, and this interesting house known as the Rietveld Schroeder House, which is the only building that was made exactly to de Stijl specifications, which now sits awkwardly next to a motorway. So yeah, the de Stijl movement was all about forcing pure simplistic abstraction, reducing everything down to its simplest elements. And these two sources heavily influenced the Bauhaus. And it was during this time that we see a lot of the most famous Bauhaus designs that ranged from really simple things like coffee pots and teapots and lamps and lighting fixtures all the way up to actual buildings. Some of my favourite examples include this lamp by Wilhelm Wagenfeld, who was described by Alice Rawsthorn, a journalist and design critic, as having pioneered the design of the modern kitchen. Later on, Wagenfeld actually described that lamp as something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing here, something along the lines of, a bloodless experiment in steel or glass or something like that. So by the end of it he didn't actually like it, but I really like it and you can still buy it in some places although it is hideously fucking expensive. Other designers that I really like include people like Marianne Brandt. Marianne Brandt was the first woman in the metal workshop and apparently she suffered a small degree of sexism while she was there, but she overcame that when she proved herself as being fucking awesome at designing things. And actually in this book, Bauhaus and Bauhaus People, which I will probably reference at other times, in this video. Brandt is quoted as saying in her Letter to the Younger Generation, In 1924, when on the advice of Maholinage I transferred from the Vorkers to the metal workshop, they had just begun to produce objects capable of being mass-produced, though still fully handicrafted. The task was to shape these things in such a way that even if they were to be produced in numbers, making the work lighter, they would satisfy all aesthetic and practical criteria and still be far less expensive than any singly produced item. That quote for me sums up so much of the Bauhaus. I freaking love Marianne Brandt. She created this very idiosyncratic looking coffee pot and this awesome ashtray. I don't even smoke. I would start smoking if I got that fucking ashtray. But again, Bauhaus designed objects are incredibly expensive. Another favourite artist of mine is Herbert Bayer. Again, heavily influenced by the constructivists, many of his wall paintings were very geometrical, straight, uncluttered, and also used text as part of his work, like the constructivists did. Bayer was also a typographer and created the typeface Universal, which is now found in its digital form as Bayer Universal. If you looked at it, you'll notice that Universal doesn't have any capital letters. This was due to the Bauhaus's rabid rejection of what they saw as needless ornamentation. So many of the Bauhaus design typefaces don't have capital letters and are sans serif, i.e. they don't have the little ornamental bit on the end of the letters. Herbert Bayer is actually quoted quite interestingly about his typefaces, and I'll read it out for you. Why do we write and speak with two different alphabets simultaneously? We do not speak with a capital A and a small a. To convey one sound, we do not need large and small letter symbols. One sound, one symbol. Oh, bad. Bastard. What a rebel. However, probably one of the most widespread disseminators of Bauhaus design was Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. His birth name was Ludwig Mies. He added the van der Rohe later on because he thought it would get him work. And he was an architect who has created many incredibly famous buildings around the world, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, so many places. One of his most influential works was Farnsworth House. A woman called Dr. Edith Farnsworth asked him to design for her a weekend retreat. What he designed was a weird sort of glass box thing, <laughs> but was incredibly influential for the time. Some of its most striking features include the glass facade. Can you imagine living in a big glass box? To be fair, it did have curtains for when you wanted a little bit of privacy, but yeah, there was no massive use of exterior walls, it was just plate glass windows. He also didn't have interior walls either, he had interior features like cabinets and uh, and bookcases and beds that would partition the house in, in ways that walls usually would. Now, Dr. Farnsworth 
didn't like this house. Possibly understandably, but it was incredibly influential and was seen as one of his greatest achievements. My favourite example of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's work is actually the Seagram building in New York City. It's basically just a huge black cuboid. Vastly simplistic, created with a modern aesthetic and functionalism in mind. Functionalism, although the term is debated somewhat in art and design circles, is generally held to mean the design of things that is based around its use or function, which essentially eschews all needless ornamentation and focuses mainly on what the objective of the design is. Anyway, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe created this huge shiny black cuboid in the middle of of New York City, and it just looks freaking awesome. So there are just a sample of my favourite Bauhaus contributors, but there are many other artists and designers within the Bauhaus, and all of them were incredibly important in their own way. Examples include people like Joseph Albers, a geometric abstract painter who did a lot of work that looked like it was suprematist. Suprematism is essentially an art movement that's focused on simple, abstract, geometrical forms. I think the most famous example is The Black Square by Kazimir Malevich. And these are basically just experiments in form and colour. Because up until then, painting had only ever been about representation. Actually studying basic geometrical shapes and forms wasn't really that popular. So people would just paint these incredibly simple geometric forms as visual experiments. Going back to Joseph Albers, he also created this lovely little set of nesting tables. Okay. Other people like Marcel Brauer, who created various very famous cantilever chair designs, who was actually involved in a legal battle with a guy called Mart Stamm over who actually invented the first cantilever chair. Mart Stamm won. Whatever. We also have the famous Vasily Kandinsky, who was actually ousted by the Russian constructivist for his mysticism. Now, Vasily Kandinsky's work actually varied a lot throughout his entire career, but you can see a lot of it is very straight, very geometrical, very clean. Another example is the very multi-talented Oskar Schlemmer, who was a painter, a designer, a choreographer. He was incredibly multi-talented, for instance, he designed the second Bauhaus logo, but also choreographed the Triadic Ballet, which is possibly the weirdest piece of performance art you will ever fucking see. So yeah, very multi-talented guy. In fact, many of the Bauhaus practitioners were known for being incredibly multi-talented. Lazo Mahalinaj was a painter, a sculptor, a photographer who experimented with the photograph. He also ran the metal workshop for a while. Oskar Schlemmer created ballets and logos. Even Walter Gropius, who was known as being one of the three main modernist architects, beside Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and the French Le Corbusier, created a teapot that you can still buy today, known as the Tack Teapot. And you don't just have to look at specific examples of Bauhaus work to see its influence. Furniture stores like Moody for instance, who created this acrylic table, which is literally just a bent piece of thick acrylic, nothing else, so simple. Obviously modernistic in design. My favourite example is probably IKEA. I had a quick look through the IKEA website and found this. It is a storage solution known as Bestar. I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. If you are Swedish, feel free to correct me, but I think it is Bestar. Instantly you can see the influence of modernism. It's got clean, straight, horizontal and vertical lines, and instead of adopting symmetry as a foregone conclusion, the unit invokes a sense of balance following its clear and obvious functionality. It's also significant to understand how the emphasis of the unit is much more about volume and space than it is about mass. The unit has been made to frame the areas in space that it compartmentalizes instead of being a household object in and of itself. Vesta is made to be a storage unit and nothing more. Yes, it looks nice. Its form has followed its function. What Vesta does is utilize the space it inhabits without employing unnecessary ornamentation, but still maintains a pleasing visual aesthetic. Essentially, Vesta works not as an object in and of itself, but as a means to an end. It frames space. This object is not about mass, it's about compartmentalizing space and volume. And interestingly enough, Besta actually bears a striking resemblance to the work of various Bauhaus furnishing designers, such as a cabinet designed by Alma Buscher. Very similar designs. And as you're all probably aware, IKEA is all about mass production. IKEA refers to its flat packing as democratic design. This fits in with the Bauhaus's emphasis on designing products with mass production in mind, which is a concept that IKEA has clearly embraced. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. And considering it was a design school that existed in Germany in the 1930s, being modernist wasn't actually that good an idea if you wanted to exist. Because the Nazis 
hated modernism. They saw it as un-German, international, and heavily influenced by Jews, which it might have been because a lot of the Bauhaus members were Jewish. And it was also described as a hotbed of Bolshevism, which may or may not have been the case in some small part. One of the main guys in the later years of the Bauhaus was Hannes Meyer, who was an ardent socialist who encouraged the students to start socialist parties themselves. But then again, Walter Gropius had always said that the Bauhaus was apolitical. But either way, the Nazis did not like the Bauhaus. And in late 1932, they had to leave Dessau due to political oppression from the Nazis, and they spent about six months in a warehouse in Berlin when they were finally closed down by the Nazis in 1933. Unwittingly, however, the Nazis probably made the modernist design, which they hated so much, far more ubiquitous. Because they hated the Bauhaus so much, they pretty much forced a lot of the members of the Bauhaus to leave Germany. Some of the Jewish people went to British-controlled Palestine, Walter Gropius went to England for a while before moving to America, other members went around Europe, and a lot of Bauhaus contributors like Walter Gropius, as I've just said, um, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and Laszlo Mahalinaj moved to America. This created a massive international spread of Bauhaus practitioners all over the world. Now, Laszlo Mahalinaj tried to continue the Bauhaus in Chicago under the name New Bauhaus. Due to money troubles that was closed down pretty quickly after about a year, but after getting some financial help, it was reinvigorated as the Institute of Design, which in 1949 became part of the Illinois Institute for Technology, which still exists today. So we've seen what the Bauhaus has produced. We've seen how it spread and developed around the world. But there is a mistake that a lot of people make in thinking that there is a Bauhaus design, and people confuse modernist design in general with Bauhaus design. This isn't necessarily the case. A guy called Walter Dexel, who I think was an artist and art critic around at the time of the Bauhaus, said this in an essay called The Bauhaus Style, A Myth. In his last paragraph, he says this, one can no longer simply cover a broad range of phenomena that grew from many roots with the catchword Bauhaus style. That phrase fosters a myth. It is an inadmissible oversimplification and unfairly conceals the many significant forces that work to create the style of the 20s. That was from Bauhaus and Bauhaus people again. And he was right. The Bauhaus did not invent modernism, nor did it invent its unconventional teaching structure. What was really the case was summed up pretty well by Gillian Naylor in her book Bauhaus Reassessed, very close to the very start of her introduction to this book. Other schools of art, design, and architecture in Germany had experimented with preliminary courses and an interdisciplinary approach approach, and Gropius's preoccupation with type forms and standardization had a long prehistory in philosophies of manufacture. The school's attempts to establish a methodology for design through what Kandinsky described as the new science of art had their counterparts in Russia and Holland. She continues, though, What is unique about the Bauhaus, however, is the fact that its ideologies epitomized changing concepts concerning the nature and purpose of design in the early 20th century. The school inherited, reinterpreted, and rejected the craft ideals of the 19th century. It attempted to discover laws in art that could be related to design and architecture, and its fundamental aim was to establish a fundamental language of form that would represent the elimination of social as well as national barriers. So the Bauhaus did not create modernism. The modernist style came from various sources, like I mentioned, from Russian constructivism, from de style. Some of its principles even came from the arts and crafts movements, from people like William Morris. You could even argue that modernism came about simply as a reaction to the stylistic excesses of earlier design movements like Art Nouveau. What the Bauhaus did do is bring all of this together into one place at one time. So the fact that it took from so many different sources, and due to the fact that it was closed down by the Nazis, meaning a lot of the contributors had to flee, this all contributed to a somewhat bizarre effect of a comparatively small German design school spreading the principles and ideas of modernism internationally as part of the vast modernist design movement of the 20th century. Put simply, the Bauhaus School has quite literally changed the environment that people all over the world are seeing and experiencing every single day. Every time you go into a city and you see a huge skyscraper with a big glass facade, that's modernism and that's the Bauhaus. Every time you go into a modern kitchen where all the objects, from the tables to the utensils to the lighting fixtures, are all designed with functionalism and simplicity in mind, that is modernism and that is the Bauhaus. So I guess what I'm trying to say is... The Bauhaus is everywhere. You've just got to look in the right places. Now to sum all this up, I have to challenge myself and say that although I really, really love the Bauhaus, I don't agree with its principles 100%. I like looking at and designing and creating things just because they look nice. And one of my favourite modernist design movements is Art Deco. And Art Deco, unlike a lot of modernist art movements, was pretty much entirely devoid of philosophy or motive and was purely decorative. And I freaking love Art Deco. Having said that, I still absolutely adore Bauhaus philosophy and Bauhaus design. And I hope you do too. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. See you later.